I'm going to introduce our special guest. First of all, I do see a couple new faces today, so I'll introduce, I'll introduce myself first. I'm Jennifer Shahadi. I am the Women's Program Director at US Chess and a two-time US Women's Champion. And today I have an old friend and a famous chess educator. She was chess educator of the year. She was famously featured in Brooklyn Castle, the acclaimed documentary about the school that Elizabeth teaches at, IS318. Elizabeth Spiegel, thank you so much for joining us again. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And for those of you who were at Elizabeth's first lesson, do you remember what she talked about? I think she gave you a little insight into what the second lesson would be at at the very end of that. That's right, Sujana, open files, rook files. And, you know, Elizabeth, ever since then, um, your lesson keeps coming up in other people's lessons. Fantastic. Like Fiona Mutesi the other day, she was here and everybody was trying to use her open files. So, um, you know, last time I didn't show you guys any clips from Blick and Castle because we had such a packed itinerary. But I did want to just show you a very quick clip from it now. And part of the reason is that is that. Uh, Brooklyn Castle came out about nine years ago, but since the success of the Queen's Gambit, there's been renewed interest in it, and it's actually re-releasing, so um, there are, it should be easier to, to see it on all sorts of different networks. Um, I'll, I'll post a link in the chat at some point, or you can actually go to brooklyncastle.com later to find out where you can watch it, um, and there is this really nice clip featuring Elizabeth, so I'll show that now. This has changed about your life. Yeah, um, I've had two kids, uh, um, and, and the schools, we went, we went back for like three days last, uh, this week, and now we've gone remote again. Um, but hopefully next year everything will be back to normal, and the chess team will be going to tournaments every Saturday, and just like in the, just like in the film. Nice, hey, so I'll let you um, share your screen and get right. into tonight's lesson on the seventh rank. Thank you so much. Um, so I want to talk um, about the things I know that are useful about the seventh rank. Um, and the main important technique for the seventh rank is extending the seventh rank. And that's where we'll start. Um, and I think of it as a really specific version of the rule that when you're winning, you should try to open the position, right? Um, extending the seventh rank is going to increase the power and attacking strength um, and also make it harder for the king to, to get you to leave. So this is our first example. Of course, we're going to put our rook on the seventh, and they're going to defend their pawn. And now, extending the seventh rank means getting them to move a pawn up to make the seventh rank longer. Right? So, he, um, you know what? If you have a, Sarah, you have a question? I was going to wait until you're done, but I was thinking maybe we could play rook to e7 to attack the e pawn. Fantastic. Rook d7 is a really important idea because once we force this pawn to f6, the seventh rank is a little bit bigger. And now, if they come to attack us, their king is limited by the fact that it has to defend the king side pawns. Right? So um, this game went like this. Um, but h5 is an important idea, um, possibly with threatening to play h6. And if they take, we've extended the seventh rank even more. Um, and we can take on h7 and then threaten h8. So black stops us. But we can bring our king in. And the main point here is that king, king e 8 never gonna be possible because this pawn will always hang, right? And by pushing h5, um, we, uh, they can't push the g pawn, right? Because of en passant. Um, so we've gotten this little permanent rook on the seventh, and we can bring our king in and, and proceed to win. So I want to make a sort of technical point about controlling the seventh rank. Here, white controls the entire seventh rank, right? There's no way for the king to go like around the pawn on the, on the right side. Um, and so the king can never come out. And white has a simple win here. Can you guys tell me in the chat, like, what does white do to just win the game? Great, a short variation would be fantastic. Yes, the white king's not on the board. Um, I understand that's not really 
So, so okay. But the point is just to focus your attention on what's important in the position. It seems like Elizabeth and Rowan um, got the variation. Yes, fantastic. Um, I see a lot of people with the white first move. Well done, Vanessa and Carissa and Shayra. But Elizabeth, if you can, just tell me. Fantastic. Um, yeah, we're going to play A7. And of course, they can stop us. But then we have this simple maneuver, rook, rook B8 and Rook B7. And they can't sneak away with their king. And so we force them to take it. Compare that position to this next one. Do you see here the difference that black does not control the entire second rank? The control of the second rank stops here. And so the king is not really so tied down. Um, and here, if black tries B2, then we can play rook B1 and we can move our king over on the, on the third rank and win the pawn. Um, does that difference sort of make sense about here, white's it's completely winning because we control the whole seventh rank as compared to here, it's not completely winning because the king can get involved. Okay, um, more about ex another extending example. Of course, we want to get our rook on the seventh. A black plays here to shield the, the b-pawn. Now, can we play rook d8? Can black play rook d8? Sacrificing the c-pawn to get counterplay? Well done. Um, I'm sorry, I'm gonna mess it up. Falchi, Falchai. Well done, Vanessa and Violet. Right, we can't, but can't do this to get take remove the defense, right? The black plays rook c8, and we can't play rook e7, right? And and um, this is the night. So. Um, so uh, white plays bishop d5 here. And this is an important idea, right? When you're not sure what to do, attack the opponent's weak point. Because if rook, rook f8 loses a c pawn, and this beautiful move bishop d5 forces the knight back. So here we are with our first poll question. What would you play here? h4, rook e7. King G2 or E4. Um, raise your hand if you want to be unmuted to explain your move. We've got a few people who'd like that. Wonderful. How about Tara? Um, I said rook E7 because you're threatening rook E8. Um, and then yeah. the knight is going to be pinned after that. Um. <laughs> And then also, um, you're also attacking the you're also attacking the e5 pawn, so um, black has to find a way to defend that, and they cannot move the they can't move the um, they can't move the f pawn because it's pinned to the king. Um, so I think that the only way for them to defend that pawn is by moving the knight, and then once you move the knight, then you're going to take the pawn on um, then you're going to take the pawn on f7. Yeah, so um, uh, nice idea. We can't play f6 right now. Um, and definitely rook e7 is, is, is going to be um, extending the seventh rank in a second. Um, I, I want to mention also um, e4 is probably the worst move here just because the bishop gets trapped. Have to be very careful when you have a bishop not to put the pawns on the same color. Um, king g2 and h4 are, are reasonable moves, but this move, rook e7, is a really nice one. Um, now, black does have a way to save the pawn, right? Black first plays c6, kicking the bishop back. And then black has f6. But this move, f6, extends the seventh rank, right? And here, the game goes on for a long time, but 
Black never gets White's Rook off the seventh rank. Um, I know a few good ideas here. You can play King G2, or you can play B4 and start pushing your queenside pawns. Um, but clearly, oh, sorry. Um, clearly these pieces are pretty terrible when you compare them to White. And um, here's our second quiz question. If you take a look at this position, White has a number of interesting tactical opportunities. All right. So what do you guys notice about the position material-wise? Be sure to note that as you're analyzing. We've got... Okay, once again, yes, we've got a couple of people raising their hands um, to give their answer. Very nice. Uh, uh, can I choose uh, Rania? Rania? I said knight takes f6 because if g takes f6, then rook c7, you're threatening me, and I don't think they have a way to stop it. Absolutely. Um, and here, we, we're extending, we're opening the seventh rank for tactical reasons, right? Not just... Um, not just because uh, the rook is more powerful because it restrains the king, but the, it also increases the attacking chances of the rook. Um, now, a lot of people put rook c7, and of course, getting a rook on the seventh is hard to argue with. Um, but probably black was going to try to do something to like trade queens, um, right? To try to diffuse the tension. And, and but knight takes f6, pretty forcing. All right. Um, so, um, we're next going to look at a couple positions. We're going to talk a little bit about defending the seventh rank. Um, and we're going to look at two positions where I'm going to ask you, do you want to try to play something like rook d2 to stop your opponent getting on the seventh rank? Or do you want to play rook d7 and get on the seventh rank yourself? So we're going to have two positions that are interesting and similar. And this is the first one. Um, so it's actually time for our next uh, poll question. Most people say in rook d7. Yeah, um, let's see if somebody wants to explain their answer. Tanvi? I would play rook d7 because I feel it would be more like active than rook d2 when you're attacking a7 and the king. And so that seems very reasonable. But the thing is that um, with rook endings, you have to make judgments based on sort of concrete calculations. So unfortunately, rook d7 kind of loses material here. Um, anyone see what black is going to do to win the a pawn? Um, Tara, uh, sorry, Carissa. Um, rook c1 check, then rook c2 check, and then take the pawn. Right. So it just doesn't tactically work, right? And instead, it makes much more sense to play rook d2 and make sure they don't get on the seventh rank. So kind of a tricky one. Um, try this one. Here, and sorry, I'm going to actually end the polling and, and share the results. Um, most people thought rook d7. Fair enough. Um, this next question is our next poll. And it's the same kind of question. Do you want to play rook c7 here? Do you want to play e3 or king f1? And I made them separate, though they're pretty similar, right? They're sort of about keeping the other guy's rook off the seventh. Yeah, we got a, we got a high percentage of voting. That's what we'd like to see. So um, they're going to <laughs> Sarah. I chose rook c7 because although the black rook can take your pawn on e2, you can take back their pawn on b7 and also at the same time guard your b2 pawn. That makes a lot of sense, right? We just want a pawn here. And um, we can defend this. And now we're threatening rook a5, excuse me, b5. And we get a rook on the seventh, but we also get the outside pass pawn. Right. So wait, one thing. Can you yes. go back to the can you go back to that position where so rook c seven, rook takes e two. Sorry. Rook take, one second. Okay. Uh, 
Yeah, rook c7. Rook takes, rook takes. Pawn. I think you played... What happened here? Yes, there, and then b3. There. Takes. Wouldn't you be able... Maybe to threaten rook b5? Because if the rook takes, then you have a clear pass because the king is outside the distance it needs to. Um, I'm suspecting they won't take it to play rook a3, though, right? But I see what you mean. Um, I mean, I, I, I think probably this is it looks like a super useful move to restrain the king. And, and white has some nice chances to win. You know, there's still a little technical work to be done. But um, but definitely, definitely uh, you know, putting your rook on the seventh is the right idea here. Okay, next two positions, I'm gonna ask you to define a defense for black. So this isn't a, um, a poll question. I couldn't think of how to word it, but maybe you can tell me in the chat, what, what move for black um, defends the seventh rank? Very, if you can just tell me that's better. Um, but, cat's out of the bag maybe. Well done, um, Violet and Carissa and Melinda and, and Rowan and Sarah. Uh, sorry, um, Sarah, not quite. I think your notations are soft. And Rania and Sharia. Absolutely, yeah. We're going to play rook to g8 here, right? And we're anticipating rook to d7 and preparing to block. And here's our next example. Again, you're black. White's rook is already on the seventh. And you have to defend f7, maybe. But black can play the great move. Rook to c8. Now we're threatening checkmate on c1. So they have to do something to stop that. And then we have time to play rook c7. Yeah, easy to miss that we're threatening checkmate, but yeah. All right. Um, next up is the very, very beautiful tactic that so often occurs on the seventh rank, which is the windmill. Um, and it's time. I'm just going to share results from the last poll, um, which I thought was kind of cool, because actually if you add up E3 and King F1, the two defensive moves are, you know, they got 20, what, 21 votes. So not so dissimilar to rook C7. Um, but we, um, the next few poll questions, um, I'm asking you which piece you would move because I didn't want to specify particular moves. Hmm. We're ready for the next poll question and it's, should you, it's white to move. Should white move the rook, the queen or a bishop? Mm, that's a great way to do it, love it. And they're used to it because sometimes we play hand and brain in the class. Mm -hmm. So we have polls that we use to administer it. Very nice. Um, Paula Chai, am I saying that right? So should we get somebody um, off uh, on a video again? Somebody want to tell? I don't think Sujana has spoke on camera yet. Sujana? Um, so what I would move is I, would, I chose the queen. Because maybe I can move it to queen f6, queen takes f6. If the pawn on g7 takes, then it can play um, bishop h6. And then if I, and then I, the king is forced to play king g8, and then I can put bishop f7 check. Well, it's not checkmate, but it wins the queen. Yes, but it wins the queen, but it wins the queen for a bishop and a rook, right? Um, so your your beginning is fantastic, but we have something better than bishop f7 here. Um, anyone else see what, what we have here besides bishop f7? Uh, Tanvi? You can play rook g7, and then you if he goes... King F8, then you like take the pawns. Like, Wait, and this is like rook takes C7, and like, like 
then King has to go back to GA, and then you go rogue G8, so then repeat the process and take all of the time. Fantastic. And so if you haven't seen this tactic before, we're going to go back and forth with our rook, taking everything or almost everything. And sometimes we have to think about the last pawn um, on the seventh rank. But here we're going to take this. And now what? Because if you look at this, this we're actually um, down quite a bit of material. Like if we take the queen, they're going to take us back and... You know, we're down, what, um, a rook in an exchange. There's only one move here that wins for white. And it's a pretty amazing one. I see it in the chat. Well done. It's bishop f7. And so we're removing the guard of the rook on a8. And we're setting up another, um, right, they can't play queen f8. They have to play this to give themselves an escape square. And now we're up a huge amount of material. That's a great example. Where is that from? Um, that is, I got it from a, a Yusupov book. Um, it's Schmidt Muth. Nice. Yeah, it's a great game. Here's my next position. Um, and you know what? I feel like, um, Jen, we always forget to share the results, um, but maybe that's interesting. Um, so I'm just. Yeah. And um, I think Melina asked, what about queen c5? So I guess she picked queen. Um, yeah. Should we go back here? What about queen c5? Ah, oh, an interesting move. Um, so I have to go here, right? Yeah. And then what? And Bishop of seven is always sort of, you know, they get reasonable material, right? Yeah, but you have the two rooks. Um, so Bishop f seven, yeah, Queen f seven, Rook f seven, King f seven, and is there something really good for White here? Uh, it does it, Black also has a pawn, right? So we have a pawn and the two rooks for the queen. So seems like we're hanging on here. If you could somehow coordinate your queen and your bishop together, white would probably be winning. Um, but I just don't see a way to do it because that pawn on c7 actually defends really well, like the d6 square. Okay. Seems like we're, we're, we're barely hanging on here as black, I think. Certainly not as beautiful as the checkmate windmill that we, we saw. <laughs> Um, oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, what did I do? And so I will stop sharing these results now. Um, all right. And it's time for our next poll question, which is exactly the same. Oh, by the way, if you, if you were intending bishop h6 instead of queen takes f6, this is also a fantastic move. So I know some people put bishop. And if that was your idea, that's actually also pretty terrific. So it is white to move here. Um, Black just blocked a check with the queen on f7. Elizabeth, can you explain your move? Elizabeth, you, uh, you're, you're muted, Elizabeth. Oh, so uh, I chose rook to c7 because after queen takes uh, queen and rook to e 7 you can do so sort of like in the other part. Uh, and the other one to rook takes takes everything on the wait and we're gonna take um everything from the seventh rank. We don't uh, we often don't want to take the last pawn and this is sort of a nice example of that right if we take on a7 we actually just activate black's rook and then when we go after the queen they get our bishop so it makes more sense here not to take the a7 pawn, not to activate the rook on a8, just to go after the h7 pawn and then take the queen. Fantastic. So many people got that one right. And here's our last windmill example. Well done. Should black move her queen, rook, or bishop? And I like these examples because I always see the same examples of windmills somehow. They're always like done to black on the king side. Are these from actual games? Yes, this is from Dos Santos Ginsburg, San Rafael, 1992. Um, but where did I find it? I found it in a Yusupov book. They're very good. 
very hard, but lots of interesting information about chess. All right, so well done voters. You're doing incredibly well. Um, you know, he has a series, he has a lot of series, um, Boost Your Chess and Train Your Chess, and they all look identical, the books. Um, I find the books after like one incredibly difficult, um, but all the one books are pretty good. Level one book. I mean, if you're if you're nineteen, if you're like two thousand, like go for two probably. But for Yusupov, I'll let you spell that, Jen. <laughs> I feel like there are many, many um, ways to spell Yusupov, and and the one in chess space is completely incompetent. Uh, yeah, you never find any. Of them. I think this is the right this one. Yeah. Yeah, but if you look in, in chess space, it's J J U double S or something, P O W. In any case, um, well done on the should we end the polling and share the results with them? Yeah, sure. I'll end it and share. Okay, so mostly rook. And somebody wanna tell us where they move that rook to? Let's see, uh I think uh Tor Tori. Um I would move my rook to E2. And then after, since the queen is under attack and, it, and it's in a pin, it can't take the rook, so it has to take the queen. And then I would play rook takes g2 check. And then king moves over. And then I would uh, take the c2 pawn. King moves over. I check again on g2. King moves over. And then I would take the B pawn. And here, I think I would either take, well, I'd actually probably check here again. King was over. And then maybe even take the queen with the pawn. Because yeah, there were lots and lots of good ways to play this. Um, in the game, they played book takes, check, and then a takes. Um, but at that point, blacks up a, a lot of pawns, um, a lot of pawns, <laughs> um, and won pretty easily. Well done. Okay. Um, two problems just for fun. These I couldn't really. They weren't super thematic, but they were such beautiful examples of the strength of the, the seventh bank that I wanted to show them to you. Um, so Black just played f6, attacking the knight. And it's so easy um, to move the knight, right? But White sacrifices the knight just to get on the seventh rank. Queen, sorry, queen g3, right? Allowing the capture just to be able to play queen g7. So, okay, we're threatening the rook. Rook f8 to defend the rook is forced. And we get the rook on the seventh too. And it's amazing just how dominating this is. Um, um, Black immediately gives back, gives the queen, um, and then tries to, to make it work with the rook and the bishop and the past pawns. Um, but something like queen d6, just trying to defend, um, this variation sort of shows like just how powerful it is. White plays rook a7, threatening to checkmate. And then after taking on h7, we can threaten rook g, queen g6. Um, and black sort of has to defend the eighth rank from both sides. So I won't show you the entire game after after Queen takes C7 because you know there's some long fight for um but but white sort of winning clearly all the time. And then this last problem is actually it's not the last problem. Um we're gonna look at one one further idea after this. But um this next problem is a is a calculation challenge. So this is made in five and it's all forced. And it's all sort of a straight line, but it's pretty tricky to see. So see if you can see it and tell me the entire maiden five privately in the chat. And if you can only get like three moves in, then tell me that. Um, 
Wow, Anaya, well done. That is hard. Wow, Rowan, you are amazing. Fantastic, Beryl. Well done, Melina. Amazing, uh, Haratha. Haratha? I think this is a particularly, it's easy to get like a couple moves into it, but seeing the whole five moves, very nice if you can do that. Ritha. So the H is silent. Ritha. Oh, fantastic. Um, Carissa, you're close. Ritha. It is way to move. Yes, Anastasia. Um, one more move. You're, you're so close. Yeah. Vanessa, fantastic. It's a really nice mate. I love it. And this kind of calculation problem, like if you're, um, if you feel like you're halfway there, like keep, keep pushing, keep trying. Cause this, I feel like this is a very instructive example or a nice practice problem for, for calculation. So easy to stop one or two moves early and be like, ah, oh, is that something there? Um, Sahana, fantastic. Pretty sure you're on the right track. Liliana, that's amazing. Well done. Carissa, fantastic. You are very close. Keep thinking right there. We have, a, we have some grown-up students in today's class. Uh, I think that they, I, I don't think any of them have answered it yet, but I, it's a great challenge for them because this type of visualization can sometimes be um, difficult for adult learners, but then when they get it, they really get it. Well done, Siri. Well done, Tanvi. Zoe, good job. Fantastic, Carissa. Um, Risha. Sorry, I'm just scrolling up trying to see it. Yes, you're good so far, Prisha. Um, well done, Cecily. Fantastic. Well done, Sharia. That is an interesting idea. Um, I'm not sure what you mean, Elizabeth. Fantastic, um, Paula Chai. So I'm gonna start showing the answer. Great well, job to everyone who got it. Most I think people, this one's hard because it looks like somehow the pawn is gonna be involved in promoting or something or pushing forward. Like that, that is like a, a red herring of it. So most people got this far or a lot mm -hmm. of people got this far but i think here is where it starts to get difficult right because it's easy to play rook f7 um and it's really easy to get stuck here and be like i am out of moves um but here everybody see the final move yeah now they're now they everybody who didn't see it before i feel like even more people are seeing it that's right beautifully written siri knight d5 checkmate so one thing that's really important for getting better is when you have a problem like that and you don't get it, you have to try very hard to visualize the solution. Um, so I'm going to say the moves here and I want everyone, especially if you didn't get it, to try to follow along. I'm going to say the moves. You're going to follow along, moving the pieces in your mind, and then I'm going to move the pieces again. So Rook F7 check. King G8, Knight E7 check, King H8, Rook F8 check, King G7, Rook G8 check, King F6, and then the back, backwards move Knight D5 is checkmate. So again, now I'm going to show the moves. If you had trouble visualizing it. And also, if you didn't get it, always important to say to yourself, what didn't I see? Like, what question could I ask myself next time so that I would get that? And for, for a lot of people, it's they give up about here and they think, I don't see anything anymore. Um, Maybe. Yeah, because it looks like you're letting the king out. You know, you're getting them closer to the center. I love your technique, Liz. I I really used that a lot when I was uh, growing up. 
Um, and when I got a lot better at chess, I did that a lot where if I got a problem wrong, I would re, I would basically redo it and pretend, even though I already knew the solution, I would like, pretend that I was thinking about it again and was actually solving it correctly. It, it's a weird kind of psychological thing. I'd be like, oh yeah, this is like me five minutes ago and I don't know the answer. And then like model myself getting it right. Mm. And I think it was a tremendously important um, trick. And it's also the positive side of getting a problem wrong that you can then use that technique. That's super interesting because it sounds like it both addresses like the pattern recognition and the, and the confidence at the same time. Wow, a really nice, really nice idea. So I'm just going to throw in something that's sort of um, a little bit random at the end. Um, but one really useful rule about the seventh rank is that two rooks on the seventh um, will always be checkmate if you have any other piece that controls g7. And I have two quick examples of that here. Um, just the move knight f5, but also the move knight g, um, h5. They actually both completely work. And then there's no way to stop rook h8. Um, and this can be a nice sort of shortcut in calculation um, that... Oh, sorry. I made two moves there, didn't I? Um, yeah, knight f5 here. The, yeah, I'm having that. Um, and then one more example of it. White well, doesn't want to trade rooks here. White well, wants to keep both rooks on the seventh. So it starts with the checks. But what move here just wins for White? Tell me privately in the chat if you see it. <laughs> well done, Elizabeth. Immediate. Well done, Melina. Paula Chai. It's a beautiful name. Well done. So just checking on the seventh rank, um, like if all we're doing is sorry, um, if all we're doing is checking, it's just we're not just a draw. Um, if we go back, some people suggested moving back on the set, on the G file, but we're not threatening checkmate with rook H8 because they can go king E7, king D8. Um, so we want to play rook H8, but we first need something to guard the G7 rook. Well then, uh, Ranier and Elizabeth and, oh, some people suggesting moving the rook over. Yeah, so if I move the rook over, then they're gonna go here, then they go back with their king to g8. Go back. But instead we can play the really simple, but really deadly h4. Um, oh, sorry, we can also just play it here, right? h4. We're gonna play h5 and h6 and rook h8. And even with three moves, there's nothing that black can do about it. That is my lesson on the seventh rank. So most important technique is extending the seventh rank, right? Getting them to move a pawn up. Um, the windmill, such a beautiful tactic on the seventh. Um, we, and then we also talked about a couple of defending ideas, whether you should defend or attack. Um, and this last idea of, of anything controlling G7 um, being enough with two rooks for checkmate. So thank you guys so much for your attention and, and hard work. Um, I really enjoyed teaching the class and thank you, Jen, for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. Do you guys have any questions related to the lesson? Um, Violet asks, how do you avoid getting frustrated when calculating? I think you have to choose, I mean, first of all, you have to choose good problems, right? Because some, some tactics are pretty frustrating and like impossible to get, I feel like. So ha having a, a good book, um, uh, I think it's pretty key. Um, you were yeah. at one last time, didn't you? By, uh, was it like st chess strategy was by... Halston. Can you remind me? Mastering Chess Strategy by Halston. Okay, yeah. Um, I, 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 as a tactics book though, I really love, I really love steps, chess steps. Um, and I really super love um, Jeff Coakley's Winning Chess Exercises for Kids. Um, but steps is very good also. A series of workbooks. And what's your favorite website for doing tactics or do they kind of like all, all good for you? There's an app you can download called Chess Tutor. Um, and Chess Tutor 3 is, is really my favorite. Chess Tutor 1 and 2 is more for um, 
the, but, but just two to three is like, you know, good up to 16, 1800, um, anywhere from, from 13 to 1600, 1200 to 1600. Um, just two to three has some amazing problems. It's a, I think it doesn't work on Macs, like Apple products. It only works on Windows. Uh, Um, people are asking about how to watch the whole movie of Brooklyn Castle. I know it's available on YouTube. It's probably available on Amazon also. And there, it, with this new release, it's available on a lot of extra channels. And, and Elizabeth, how does it feel watching? It, how many times have you watched it? You had probably had to go to a lot of openings, right? Where you, you spoke. Yeah, I had to go to a lot of openings. Um, uh, you know, it's always a little uncomfortable seeing yourself, especially your younger self on screen. Um, but it's nice to see the kids always, and it's such a well done movie. It was a, a thrill to be part of it. Um, Sophie asks if you prefer in person or online chess games. I think you answered that in our last class. I think I know the answer to this one. Yeah, I really love playing in in real life. Um, I feel like it's so so different from everything else we do. Like when you go to away, go away, especially when you go away to a tournament, and that's all you're doing the whole weekend is just sitting across from someone thinking. I find that a real um, a really nice contrast to like teaching and, and regular life. Um, Marissa has one last question. I think this will be the last question. Sujana, I, I did get your question about using the seventh rank to attack F2 and F7. And I think that Elizabeth's first example kind of went over that with Bishop D5, right? Of course, there are a lot of examples where F2 and F7 gets targeted and then they have to move that and you have a, a wider seventh rank, right? Um, yeah. So that does come up in a lot of problems. Um, but Marissa uh, actually went to my alma mater. She's a student at Masterman High School, along with my brother. And she started a chess club for girls there. So Marissa, you want to ask your question to Elizabeth? Yeah. Um, um, so I was wondering, like Jen, said, like Jen said, I started a club at my school to teach girls like how to play chess like beginners and stuff so I was wondering like are there any like methods or like certain ways you recommend for teaching beginners because like I still started it and I'm just trying to figure out like what would be the most effective best way to like yeah um I love the chess steps method um it, it's it'll give you a lot of materials and a lot of like um uh just sort of the nuts and bolts of like what positions to teach and what lessons to teach and what to say so it's a pretty um detailed curriculum um uh i have one online elizabeth or is that something you have to buy the the books yeah um so you have to buy the books um they have instructor manuals. Um, the other book that's re really good is Jeff Coakley's Winning Chess Exercises. For, sorry, Winning Chess Strategy for Kids. It's green. All of his books are a different color, but they all have incredibly similar names. Um, but I, I stole a huge number of lessons from that, um, especially when I was starting out. Um, but really accessible, really stealable lessons. Um, Winning Chess Strategy for Kids by Jeff Coakley. I'll, um, yeah, I used to use those books too when I was teaching beginners more often. Um, and I concur, it's like really, really well presented. Marissa, you probably would enjoy that. That would really help. Um, and I'll put those in the chess.com group too, Marissa, or you can always ask me. Um, but it's a tremendous initiative. There's a lot of girls here who do work uh, to teach more girls chess, which is beautiful because that's how we can widen this group. There's Sarah from Chess Girls DC. I think there's several other people. Ritha helps us with our women's classes. So uh, yeah, I love to hear questions like that. Uh, and thank you, Elizabeth, so much for this incredible lesson. It was uh, super useful. You know, we had a previous, um, Anastasia, I, I, I we, we were going to kind of keep this Q&A really short, but if you have a real quick one, we could maybe fit it in. Yeah, it's not, it's not a long question. Um, I was just going to say, um, Many like of my friends prefer blitz over um, like standard like thirty minute chess. Like, what do you prefer, like long or like short amount of chess? Um, like I think blitz is really instructive and useful and helpful for improving. Um, me myself, like I'm I'm kind of old, so I prefer slower chess. But I really think that's a function of age. And when I was younger, I loved to play blitz. <laughs> 
Yeah. I mean, blitz can be useful if you're analyzing the games, <laughs> if you're just playing them endlessly and then never checking to see whether what you did was wrong, eh, maybe it's not as useful. Uh, but yes, uh, thanks again, Elizabeth. This was great. I hope everybody is inspired to watch Brooklyn Castle if they haven't already to get more insight into your teaching methods. And then we'll ha have you back for a third time sometime. What's like the follow up after Open Files and Work on the Seven? Like, I feel like there's no more promised lands after that. Yeah, no way you can really go. Maybe just like checkmate. <laughs> but I don't think that's a lesson. We'll switch to a new piece, a different type, of, a different piece. Thanks again, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Spiegel of IS318 in Brooklyn Castle on the seventh rank. Thank you. And thanks everybody for coming. You all did so well today.